We're going to start a new study this morning, and uh, I'd like to welcome everybody here with us this morning, Sunday School. We have uh, a lot of material to cover. I want to, uh, I want to lay this out to where it can uh, make sense and uh, make connections where you can see the uh, see what's happening in this uh, contemporary culture and see what the Bible has to say about it. Father, in thy name we pray. Give me wisdom now, Lord. Teach me that I might teach. And Father, give me understanding in the Word. Father, I pray the same as Solomon. God, give me wisdom, Lord, wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Now, if you'll turn your Bible to the book of uh, Genesis chapter number 6. I'm going to read a historical account. Something took place before the flood, the universal flood of Noah. And in the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, that's what this uh, is. Genesis chapter number 6 and verse 1. The scripture says, It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them. Now, the writer, Moses, who wrote this, calls your attention to the, uh, the increase in uh, population and the fact that daughters were born unto them. So there's no question in anyone's mind. He's referring to the feminine gender, that the sons of God, and here's where the big controversy comes in, who are these sons of God? If you have a Schofield reference Bible, Brother Schofield, which I have great respect for and who is definitely a brother, and I have his Bible, and I preached out of a Schofield Bible a week ago. But his notes about the sons of God in Genesis 6 are absolutely incorrect. He's wrong. He says the sons of God are not angels. He says that they're the line of Seth, where God uh, continued his revelation to mankind. And a lot of people hold to that and feel like that the Schofield's notes are equal to Scripture, and they are not. Schofield's notes are just like Jameson Fawcett and Brown's notes, or just like uh, uh, John Peter Lang's notes, or just like uh, 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 what's the Old Testament? There's some. Uh, uh, there's a real good uh, uh, commentary. Uh, well, Adam Clark for one, and, and you can just continue on and on and on. They're just men, and uh, they they're saved men. They love the Lord, and their notes are very good. But they can be, they are capable of error. Notes are not scripture. Even your reference Bible that you have in your hand, uh, it's full of references and it's full of notes. Uh, the Bible that I'm that I'm uh, teaching from today now has no notes. This is a uh, uh, this is a Thomas Nelson, and uh, this uh, King James Bible. That's all I use. So it's the only one I believe in. Um, I may study out of a bunch of them and try to find out uh, some comparison, but I only believe one. But it has no notes. It doesn't even have any references. It has no cross-references, period. If you could see this Bible that I'm teaching from this morning, you'll see that it has no notes, no cross-references. It's just this text on the page, and that's it. And, uh, but if you have a cross-reference Bible, you'll find cross-references, and these are fine. I have plenty of them. And I, as like I say, I have Schofield's Bible. I have a number of them. But the reason I say this is so important because if you... If you, if you if you move aside or if you don't accept what, the Bible, what I believe the Bible is teaching here, then the rest of the lesson is kind of uh, just vague for you, and it really doesn't have a whole lot to say. These were giants, the sons of God in Genesis 6, giants. Now, the fact that giants have existed and do exist on this earth is a proven fact. That's fact. There's no question about that. And, uh, but what does the Bible have to say about it, and how does that relate to the end times? That's the issue. And so this is why we're going to study this, is to show you how that the Scripture has something to say about everything that's going on in modern culture. It says in verse 3, The Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for, that his day, for he also is flesh, yet his day shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came, the daughters of men, they bear children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And practically every culture on the face of this earth has some sort of a reference to giants. And, uh, and uh, 
some sort of not only a reference to giants, but a lot of stories about them. Turn on over to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 3 with me this morning, please, in verse number 1. Deuteronomy chapter number 3 and verse 1. Now we fast forward here a long time. We jump forward in time to the time of Joshua and the time of what we call the conquest. And of course we know that Moses wrote the Pentateuch and so we know Moses lived about 1400 B.C. So we're looking at a time here of about 1350 B.C., somewhere along in there. Then we turned and went up the way to Bashan, and Og, the king of Bashan, came out against us, he and all his people, to battle at Edrai. And what follows is the story of that battle. And let's get verse number 11 of, Genesis, of Deuteronomy chapter number 3. For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of the giants. Here they are again. Now look at this carefully. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Rabbath of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, four cubits the breadth of it, after the cubit of a man, which is in anywhere from 18 to 22 inches, depending on what reference you refer to. But it would be, the cubit would be the distance from here to here according to the Na normal size of the man. You take, for example, a man that's nine feet tall, a cubit to a nine foot tall man is longer than a cubit to a five foot tall man. But they had a reference point, and it's generally within that reference, but it would give you a length of approximately 13 and a half feet would be the length of his bed, his bed which it could be on up upwards of 15 to 16 feet, depending on the length of the cubit. All right, which would make Og, the king of Bashan, uh, somewhere around 12 feet tall. Now that's tall, folks. That's tall. These ceilings right here are 12 foot ceilings to give you an indication of how tall that man would be. Standing here, his head would touch the ceiling. That's a 12 foot ceiling. And uh, uh, to uh, give you an ind 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 indication of how big he is, he would easily weigh six to seven hundred pounds, or even more. A twelve foot tall man. Easily weigh that and not have an ounce of fat on him. He would be capable, a man that size, if a man's twelve feet tall, weighs six, seven hundred, maybe even eight hundred pounds, he would be capable of handling anything in North America that he came up against uh, outside of a, uh, one of the giant bears, like the uh, brown bear or the uh, grizzly bear, in Alaska, and all he'd need then something in his hand, and he could handle that bear. Because a man that large would be immensely strong. A gorilla, for example, as I've said to you before, I got, did a little research into a gorilla, and I was amazed to find out how strong a gorilla is. To give you an example, just a few weeks ago, a chimpanzee, which is about four times stronger than a man, which tops out at about 180 sometimes 200 pounds, a chimpanzee tore the face off of a woman and tore her hands off and, and, uh, and literally ripped the door off of a police cruiser and the policeman inside shot that thing four or five times with his, with his sidearm and killed it. This thing went wild and a chimpanzee, if he hadn't shot it, it would have torn anybody. It could gotten, it just literally overwhelmed with its strength. Four times the strength of a man. You couldn't stand against it. But a gorilla, they say, they have never been able to really measure the strength of a gorilla, could go anywhere from 10 to 20 times the strength of a man. 10 to 20 times. And you have, have you ever seen an African lion or any kind of an animal in Africa take a gorilla? You've never seen it. You've never seen a photograph of it. You've never seen a video of it. If it exists, I'm not aware of it. But a gorilla has the capacity to take an animal and rip it apart. It takes trees and just forces them down and strips the vegetation off of them. All right, if a man that's 12 feet tall has anywhere near the strength of a gorilla, then you're, and, and 12 feet tall would put him just about in the same class, then you're looking at an enormously strong band of people. Yet the Israelites took them in battle. 
One of the reasons that we believe the Israelites took them in battle is because God told them, He says, I will send the hornet before you, and he will drive out your enemies. And a hornet's not a real big thing, but he'll put a hurt on you. Sometimes about that big, uh, that's the last thing I want to get stung with, a hornet. They'll put a hurt on you. And if you get a whole swarm of them after you, you're hurting. And uh, God said, I'm going to send the hornet. So he did. He sent the hornet before them and drove them out of their caves and out of their strongholds. Right now, uh, back in the 1800s, they discovered somewhere outside uh, the road between Jerusalem and Gaza. And Gaza, of course, is where uh, it's on the coast there. You've heard about Gaza. You hear it called Gaza. Uh, it's on the coast. It still exists. It's still named that. And uh, they found these enormous caves. They went inside, began to explore, found some of them over 400 feet long. Now get this, with ceilings 80 feet high. And into antiquity, the tradition has it that these were inhabited by giants. Now think about it a minute. If you lived in a cave, why would you want to put a ceiling 80 feet high? Unless, of course, you had some reason that you needed that kind of room. So I'm not saying they were 80 feet tall, but I'm saying the ceiling is 80 feet high. And this is a fact. These are facts. These are facts that can be proven in, in geography. And so uh, these giants we find down through history. Let me give you just a little bit of a record. Just a little. Small, short, quick record of some that they have found. Uh, Modern man at present, which is a little taller than he was about a hundred years ago, averages about six feet, some hundred, some more. A uh, fifteen-foot human skeleton was found in southeast Turkey in the late 1950s. A fifteen-foot in the Euphrates Valley during road construction. Now, the Euphrates Valley ought to uh, turn on a red flag for you because that's the cradle of civilization. That, of course, is Iraq. That's where they are have been fighting. Many tombs containing giants were uncovered there. This pertains to the picture of the giant human femur, and uh, myself, of course, referring to the man who wrote this article. His name is Stephen Quayle. Maximus Thrax Caesar of Rome, 235-238 A.D., was an 8-foot, 6-inch skeleton. Goliath was 9 feet plus or minus a few inches. Reference, 1 Samuel 17, verse 4. And, of course, we know David confronted Goliath. And David was just a boy at the time. King Og, spoken of here in Deuteronomy, whose bedstead was approximately 14 feet, 6 feet wide, 14 feet long, 6 feet wide. He was at least 12 feet tall. Some claim up to 18. The reason for the 18 is depending on the length of the cubit. See, that's the reason for the, for the difference. A 19-foot, 6-inch human skeleton found in 1577 A.D. under an overturned oak tree in the canton of Lucerne. Lucerne is in Switzerland. 19 feet, 6 inches. A 23-foot tall skeleton was found in 1456 beside a river in Valence, France. 23 feet tall. A 25-foot, 6-inch skeleton was found in 1613 near the castle of Chaumont in France. This was claimed to be a nearly complete find. Now, the thing about these skeletons is if they exist, they exist, don't they? And then here he says, almost beyond comprehension or believability was the find of two separate 36-foot human remains uncovered by Carthaginians somewhere between 200 and 600 B.C. Source for the above information, Joe Taylor, Mount Blanco Fossil Museum, 124 West Main Street, Post Office Box, so forth, Crosbyton, Texas. Here's his address. Here's his, his uh, website. If you'd like to pursue it further, there's the information. Giants. And here's a scale to give you an indication this is a six-foot man right here, and this is your 36-foot man. That's six times. Six times. If a six-foot man who's a weightlifter can bench press, uh, what would be a good bench press, 500 pounds? That's real good, don't you think? 
football players bench press 500 pounds. All right. What's six times that? That's 3,000 pounds. If it proportion, in other words, if he's six times stronger, which I think he's far more stronger than that. I think you were talking about 5,000, 6,000 pounds. I think you're talking about a man who could pick up an automobile and throw it at you. That's huge. Now, do you say, well, did anyone 36 feet tall ever live? Well, they found the skeleton. That's the problem. Uh, the skeleton, of course, you know, skeletons don't just grow. <laughs> Somebody lived. And if the skeleton is true, and if it's factual, and if it's a reality, then there was at one time on this earth a man 36 feet tall. Now, he couldn't walk into this building. He could step over this building, <laughs> but he couldn't walk into it. Isn't that amazing? What would you do if you were confronted by a man 36 feet tall? You'd go the other way. <laughs> Outrun him. <laughs> I don't think you could, do you? One stride for him would be equal to about 20 or 30 of your strides. In other words, when you're running 20 miles an hour, he wouldn't even be walking. If you're moving along 30, 40 miles an hour, and you can't, no man can run that fast. But if you could move that fast, uh, he might be in a slow walk. In plain words, a, a 36 foot tall man, a stride as long as that, just think how fast he could run. I mean, it's in every sense. It just blows the boggles the mind to think of such a thing. And the Bible talks about giants. Yes, sir. Well, now, brother, I know. Uh, you know, he just not. This is just. It's not that he's just the only one around. There has to be a source. Yes, sir. Twenty-one inches, and it was a cubit. Okay, they dated at that time. Well, then they they fixed a cubit at twenty-one inches at that for the for the Jews. Mm -hmm. Now, is there any doubt in anyone's mind in here this morning that giants lived? Well, what about are alive? See. The fact that they lived is one thing, but the fact that they could be alive is something else altogether, isn't it? It certainly is. Now, of course, we've all heard about Bigfoot, and you know, Bigfoot's out here, and a lot of folks don't believe in Bigfoot, and some do and some don't, and they don't know what Bigfoot is, and so forth and so on. We don't want to get off into what's called cryptozoology. How many has ever heard of that? Cryptozoology is the study of, uh, of, uh, of living things that don't fit into the natural uh, order. Okay, we're not worried about Bigfoot, but we are dealing with giants. The Bible says there were giants. Okay, now, how many of you have ever heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Dead Sea Scrolls discovered in 1947 in Qumran, the caves over there by some Arab boys, and then they continued to discover more Dead Sea Scrolls. They weren't all discovered at the same time. They were discovered over a period of time. For a long time, the Dead Sea Scrolls were in the were in the private possession of a small group of people. And the whole world was shut out. The, wor the, the world of scholars were unable. They had no access to them. They couldn't look at them. They couldn't examine them. They couldn't decipher them. Uh, so the Dead Sea Scrolls were being tightly controlled by a small group of people. Well, that, uh, that was finally uh, overcome. And the Dead Sea Scrolls now have become... I have become open to the world. Any scholar has access. If you want to take the Dead Sea Scrolls, decipher them, you can. One of the Dead Sea Scrolls was called the Book of the Giants. This was written 2,000 years ago. These Dead Sea Scrolls, they're not sure of this, but uh, most uh, the common accepted uh, uh, opinion is that they were written by a group called the Essenes. And these people lived in the, they were separate from the Jerusalem and from the temple. They believed the temple was defiled, so they had nothing to do with the temple, the priest, or any worship in the temple. They lived to themselves. They lived a communal lifestyle. And uh, they were called Essenes. The uh, uh, Dead Sea Scrolls had one book called the Book of the Giants. And they have uh, sections of that that have been deciphered. They've been translated. It tells the story of the giants on this earth. But it adds some information that wasn't, uh, that's not in the Bible. Now let me give you a warning about any information that's not in the Bible. You just take it 
with a grain of salt. If it corroborates Scripture, okay. If it, uh, if it deviates from the Bible, then leave it alone. But sometimes it may tell you something that the Bible doesn't record, but it's not necessarily a lie. The book of Enoch, for example, a, it's, a, it's a pseudepigraphic writing, it's a, it, or it's a, an apocryphal writing. Let's put it that way, apocryphal. Uh, it is a, apocryphal means hidden. The book of Enoch is a book that they claim that the last book in the Bible before the book of Revelation used, okay, when he talked about uh, when Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these coming and said, Behold, the Lord cometh ten thousands of his saints. And Peter referred to it, they say. But I do not believe that the Scriptures, being inspired of God, needed any apocryphal work. I believe that the Scriptures, the source of the Word of God, is God Himself. Let me explain something. This is very important. The pagan world has access to elements of the truth. But with access to elements of the truth, they build this great superstructure of mythology. All right? They have all these myths that, are, that, uh, that, are, that accompany the truth. They have elements of the truth. The reason they do is because the truth was revealed to mankind verbally before it was ever written down. And therefore, ancient cultures have passed down from generation to generation elements of the truth that didn't get perverted. But the problem is, God said, I will preserve my word. And He said in the book of Romans, chapter number 9, to the Jew was committed the oracles of God. In plainer words, the transmission of truth was only through the Jewish people and through the Scriptures. He preserved the transmission of truth, ancient truth, through the Jews. But it does not mean that other cultures didn't have elements of the truth. Are you following me? The book of Enoch is one of the books written by people who had elements of the truth, but not necessarily the whole truth. What they say in the book of Enoch could have parts of the truth, but it has been corrupted. And so when I say that the book of Jude and the book of uh, Peter, when Peter wrote his, his, his book and Jude, they say they quote from the book of Enoch. I say that, they, that what Peter wrote and what Jude wrote is the inspired word of God and what Enoch got, he got after the revelation that was given in the orig in, in, originally, all right? In other words, when it was originally verbally given. Enoch got a hold of it, but he perverted it. The book of Enoch did. But the truth was transmitted in its, in its complete, in its form that we have it today through preservation and inspiration of the Scriptures. Does that make any sense? That's what I believe. I do not believe that Peter needed to borrow from the book of Enoch, and I do not believe that Jude needed to borrow from the book of Enoch. I believe there was a common source of truth, and Enoch perverted it, and the Bible retains it. But the book of Enoch does have elements of the truth. And this book of giants refers to the book of Enoch time and again. The book of giants, which is a de one of the Dead Sea Scrolls, therefore, agrees with the fact that the book of Enoch is an ancient book. It's an ancient document that's been around a long time. But the point that I want to make is that these people who lived 2,000 years ago, these Essenes, if they're the ones who wrote it, knew there were giants in the earth. And what they give us here is a little more than what the Bible says. And you have to be careful with it, but I just want to show you how that there was a knowledge, common knowledge of giants all over the world. The book of uh, Giants tells part of the story, elaborates on the exploits of the giants. Especially the two children, and here we have names introduced to us that the Bible says nothing about. Since no complete manuscript exists of giants, its exact contents and their order remain a matter of guesswork. So what follows in here is a quotation of reconstructed text of the Dead Sea Scrolls about the book of giants. And here's what it says, some of it is very interesting. Here, first of all, in, in Q fragments, so forth and so on, 
a summary statement of the descent of the wicked angels bringing both knowledge and havoc. They brought knowledge with them and they brought havoc with them. All right? Now, this Dead Sea Scroll says that when these wicked angels came down, they brought knowledge with them, which was above man's knowledge. And the Bible says that men began to multiply on the earth, living over 800, some over 900 years. You can understand how things might have happened before the flood that we are just now beginning to get a hold of. That... Uh, a knowledge that was introduced to them which they shouldn't have had but these angels brought it with them when they fell. The angels exploit the fruitfulness of the earth. The book of Enoch says that 200 angels choose animals. The outcome of the demonic corruption was violence, perversion, and a brood of monstrous beings. Compare Genesis 6-4. Now, we're reading about what these Essenes had in their possession 2,000 years ago. The giants begin to be troubled by a series of dreams and visions. Mahwe, the titan son of the angel Barakel, reports the first of these dreams to his fellow giants. He sees a tablet being immersed in water. When it emerges, all but three names have been washed away. The dream evidently symbolizes the destruction of all but Noah and his sons by the flood. The giants realize the futility of fighting against the forces of heaven. The first speaker may be, and what follows here is a, is a, uh, uh, a, a the, uh, the reference to, the, to what he's saying. The first speaker may be Gilgamesh, and we know about the epic of Gilgamesh. We know it's an old Babylonian document. And what follows on down here is how that this judgment comes, and when the judgment comes, it comes upon the giants and upon the earth too. We know in the book of Genesis, according to the scriptures, that the whole earth had perverted its way before the Lord, that this business of giants and, and a, a business of angels and women cohabiting together and producing giants had perverted the whole earth. And there is, there's no, we're not certain exactly why God overthrew the earth in the first place, whether it was because of this intervention of the giants and to completely do away with them. I personally believe, according to Genesis 6, and I've said this to you before, I want you to look at it with me carefully. Genesis chapter number 6, and this is what it says for you to, as we study the Bible, look carefully. Genesis 6, verse 4. Giants in the earth in those days, also after that, when the sons of God came to the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart evil continually. It repented the Lord had made man on the earth. It grieved him at his spirit, at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created. Verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah had not corrupted himself in his family in intermingling with the uh, giants, in other words, with the off with the offspring of the angels, his pedigree remained pure. Why was that so important? Why is it so important for for Noah's pedigree to remain pure? There must be a line somewhere from Genesis three fifteen to the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. There must be. A pure line, in, not mixed with demon, demons, not mixed with fallen angels. There must be a pure line all the way from Genesis 3.15 to the birth of Christ. 
And this is why God preserved Noah. Now, Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And only through one of those sons was the Messianic line preserved. Only through one. And does anybody know which one? Shem. If you go back now and just follow along with me and begin to study what we're talking about here, it'll open up so many things for you. It'll help you understand. It'll give you a perspective. You'll never get this from the government. You'll not get this from the school system. <laughs> you'll, not, you'll not get this from the, from the man on the street. You'll not get it from religion. But the Bible will tell you that God Almighty promised the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent. The devil knew that. And therefore he knew that he could corrupt the seed of mankind. He would stop the prophecy being fulfilled. And if he had done that, it had been over. It had been over in two senses. been over in the sense that no Savior would have come, over in the sense that the Word of God was broken. The Word of God cannot be broken. The Scripture cannot be broken. The prophecy will not be thwarted. It will be fulfilled. And so when the Lord Jesus Christ showed up, He was the seed of the woman. In other words, virgin born. But He was the flesh of the house of David. And the house of David was through Shem. And it was through Shem that God revealed himself to mankind. And you'll find that when Satan tries to intervene and tries to destroy the bloodline and destroy the seed, that that's exactly what he's going after. When in uh, the time of the Persian persecution, when Israel was in captivity, if you remember, there was a man who went after Mordecai and he went after every Jew on the face of the earth. It was a pogrom. Not program, program, P-O-G-R-A-M. And that word means to literally wipe from the face of the earth an entire uh, race of people. Now, do you know who do you know who tried to do that? Haman. And do you know what he was? It tells you who he, what he was. That's important. It, it tells you that time and time again in the book of Esther. It tells you time and time again. The Holy Spirit wants you to know who Haman was. Who was he? What was it? He was an Agagite. The son of Hamadatha, it says. He was an Agagite, all right? He tried to literally wipe the Jew from the face of the earth. Why did he do that? Because the Lord Jesus Christ came into his own. He came to the Jews. He was of the seed. He was of the seed of the woman through Shem. That's where the son of David came from. That's where David came from. And the son of David, who's the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, would come through Shem. The devil used Haman to try to wipe the Jew from the face of the earth, and therefore, once again, he attempted to overthrow the prophecy of the Word of God and break the Scripture. Now, we know what Samuel did to Agag. He took a sword and hacked him to pieces. We know that Saul spared Agag. We know that because of that, Haman had a personal vendetta against the house of Israel. We know that, but we also know that God intervened, and Hadassah was her name, and that means Myrtle, it's a beautiful name, and that's who Esther was. Esther is Ishtar, which is a Babylonian god. It's just like uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They changed their names to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They changed their names to their god, just like Daniel's name was changed to, to uh, uh, what's his name, Bel, uh, something like that. Uh, I forget, it's about six or seven syllables. Daniel's name was changed too, but uh, his name is Daniel, which is a Hebrew name. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah is a Hebrew name. Hadassah is a Hebrew name, but they changed their name, changed their identity. Let's get back to the point here now. All right? God preserved the bloodline. Now, this stuff here, when you've heard this stuff that came out recently about the, uh, about the uh, Priory of Zion, about the, uh, uh, what's his name that wrote that book, made all the money off of it? That Brown, uh, what's his name? Uh, oh, right, he had a ghostwriter then. But any event, here's the bloodline shows up again. It says that, uh, you know, blasphemous statement how the Lord had relations with Mary Magdalene and how that the child that was born is the king and that that bloodline goes through the British Empire and all of that. Well, that goes back to the old British Israelism stuff. And, you know, that's still the same thing. What he's doing now, the devil is attacking the bloodline again. And this time he's attacking the bloodline and saying that it was a perversion. 
See, because now Christ is no longer the sinless, perfect son of the living God. Now he's a man just like the rest of us, and he's had a child. See the point? See the point? There's no record in Scripture where he and Mary Magdalene ever married, so the child's illegitimate. So therefore Christ was a, God forbid to even say the word, a fornicator. That's the idea. That's what that book means. That's what it is. Halt on the bloodline. Again, you see what I'm saying? <laughs> Are you following this? <clears throat> Because then people are believing it. And if you believe that, then, then Genesis 3.15 is null and void. All right? Satan doesn't give up, does he? No. All right. So we've said that. God forbid even say it. Lord, wash my mouth out. I'm <clears throat> the Lord Jesus Christ is the sinless, perfect Son of God. Above reproach. Beyond reproach. And I, you, you don't know how my blood boils when some low-down scumball like that writes a book and makes money on it, and in the process, he denigrates the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't believe. He ought to write one on Mohammed, and we'll find out what kind of courage he's got. You know anything about him, his nine-year-old wife and all that? But anyway, this uh, thing here on, uh, on uh, uh, Enoch, the book of Enoch, uh, they're talking about the giants. And... Uh, of course, they were destroyed in the flood and uh, went off into judgment, went off into, into, and uh, reserved. The Bible says that these angels that kept not their first estate in the book of Peter, where are they? What does the Bible tell you that, where they are? The angels, that, and this is who they are. The angels that came down cohabited with the daughters of men and giants were born. Where are they? Where are these angels? They're in chains. That's what he called change. The Greek word translated change of darkness there, reserved in, in the lowest hell, is Tartarus. And that is the lowest hell. Hell has different uh, compartments. That's the lowest of the lowest. They're at the bottom. They're at the bottom of the pit. They're as low as you can get. And because, why? Because they fell from as high as you can get. Their fall was from the highest point to the lowest point. So, uh, so the angels... Uh, this this, this uh, demonic spiritual intervention into the affairs of men is orchestrated. There's a mind behind it. There's an intelligence involved in this. All right. Now, how many of you are aware of the fact that this is the 40th anniversary of, of an event in New York State uh, that took place 1969? Uh, what's it called? You all know. Uh, it's called Woodstock. All right. It's one of the most abominable, despicable, filthy, rebellious hell holes that ever existed on the earth was the three days in Woodstock. The reason that it was such a great success in their eyes is because Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin showed up. Now the Beatles were invited and a lot of other groups and they declined. But Janis Joplin and Jimi Hendrix showed up. Now, kids today don't have a clue who I'm talking about. But you people my age, you go back, you know what I'm talking about. We're talking about stars of this, just like uh, Michael Jackson in their day. They were before Michael Jackson. They were the pioneers of the rock music uh, in this country along with Elvis Presley, who they call the king of rock, who introduced it and all that. But they, these people were, but they were taking it into another direction. When rock music first started, rock music was simply music, okay, if you want to call it music. I mean, but it began to morph. See, it, it began to, it began, when it started, it was music, but then it began to take on, it took on an atmosphere. It took on a spiritual component. And once it took on a spiritual component, then everything, everything changes, all right? Woodstock was the first manifestation for the world to see of that spiritual component that it took on. It was no longer just music. It was music now associated with a lifestyle. It was the drug culture, rebellion, uh, uh, open free sex that was practiced up there. Uh, all kinds of stuff was associated with Woodstock. But it became open now, you know. It's what, we've had sodomites with us forever. But when they came out of the closet, then they force a culture to make a decision. 
The culture in this country right now has been going through birth pangs for about 40 years of making a decision about what it's going to do about sodomy. And the federal government, of course, has aligned itself with it, making all kinds of federal laws and statutes, and it's going to continue. And the hate crimes legislation that's before the Congress, that's all associated with sodomy. And they have, a, they, have a, they have many branches of it, one term called pedophilia. It comes from the Greek word pedias, which is just a child. In other words, it's sodomites who go after children. Well, they're still sodomites. You can, call them, you can classify them anything you please. The Bible gives them one classification, and that's it. All right? But in any event, uh, it's, been for, it's been rammed down the throat of the people in this country who are Bible believers, who are Christians, who know that the Scripture condemns it. But 40 years ago, when this, and I see I'm 63, I'll be 63 in September next month. All right? I've been around through all this. I was 23 years old. I was 23 years old when Woodstock took place. <laughs> Grown man, fully aware, I remember it just like it was yesterday, okay? I didn't go to it, wasn't there, but that was before I was saved. I was 27 when I got saved, 19, in, so therefore in 1969 when Woodstock, I remember Jimi Hendrix, but I also remember a year later, one year, one year, Janis Joplin was dead. Jimi Hendrix was dead. I did a little nosing around yesterday. Janis Joplin came from a Church of Christ family. And her family, her mother, said that she always, from day one, demanded more attention than all the other children. There was something wrong. What was it? She needed the Lord. Jimi Hendrix, what was it? He needed the Lord. He needed to be saved. But here's what happens. Satan used, he used the rebellion, the rock, he used the sensual, the senses of the flesh. He used it to start something. And to me, the greatest thing, if you want to use the term greatest, or the most insidious thing that came out of Woodstock, is this. How many of you have ever heard the song, The Dawning of the Age of Aquarius? You heard that? A group called Hair came out with that song. And it was the age of Aquarius. So what is the age of Aquarius? What in the world is that? <laughs> what are they talking about? The age of Aquarius. Well, they made reference to astrology. They made reference to the stars. They made reference to spiritual things. But it was associated with rock, drugs, uh, free sex. It's associated with rebellion. In other words, a, a coming together, a joining together took place 40 years ago. And it now is uh, in full bloom. It's here. What's the age of Aquarius? Anybody have any idea? What, who is Aquarius? For example, let's talk, let's talk about, first of all, who is Aquarius? Aqua. Awa. Aqua. It's a water barrier, isn't he? All right. Aqua means water. All right. The age of Aquarius, therefore, would have something to do with a constellation that has Aquarius in it, right? It has to do, therefore, with a procession of the equinoxes, with a movement of time, with a measuring of time, with a forward look into the future, with something that's happening on this earth that's directed by the stars. God said in the book of Revelation, the stars fell from heaven, didn't they? Didn't they? Do you know what he has? He has proven himself already in the past to do this. When he went into Egypt, what did he judge when he went into Egypt? Do you remember what God judged when he went into Egypt? He judged their gods. <laughs> he judged their gods. He took their gods, marched them before their very eyes, and destroyed them. The gods of the Egyptians he made fools out of. That's his nature. And when we get into the tribulation period, studying the book of Revelation, into the future, he's going to take astrology and the gods of the stars and the gods of all that we're talking about, and he's going to destroy them right before their very eyes. That's future yet, though. We've run out of time. We'll get into that next week, Lord willing, and we'll start pick it up again, and we'll pick up about what we're talking about here and the connection. The age of Aquarius. Spiritual thing, boy. If anybody on this earth, anybody on this earth, should be equipped to deal with spiritual issues, who should it be? The Church of God.